Good afternoon, everyone. My name's Adam Kay, and I'm the Chief Executive Officer of Cotton Australia. Thank you so much for giving your time and your busy lives and taking the opportunity to listen to some of our story. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands in which we live, learn and work and pay our respects to all Abor Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander elders, past, present and emerging, whichever country you happen to be on today. I would also like to take this opportunity to welcome everyone to the first of our six part webinar series and introduce you to Cotton Australia for those who don't know us or who might be joining from overseas. Cotton Australia is the peak body for Australia's cotton growers and we represent around 1500 cotton farming families. We strive to foster a world-class agricultural industry that is sustainable, valued for its economic and social contributions and its production of very high quality cotton, which is in demand around the world. You'll be hearing more from me later, but first I'd like to introduce you to Thea Speechley, the founder of Raw Assembly, who will be facilitating today's session. Thea has over 20 years experience in the textile and apparel sec sector and is known for advocating change, sharing knowledge and propelling cutting edge product and innovation in the realms of sustainability and circular resource efficiency. We're pleased to have her on board and I'll hand over because we've got a lot to get through in the next 40 to 60 minutes. We hope you enjoy this session. Thanks, Adam. And um, again, I'd like to welcome everyone to the session today. Um, I'm just going to do really quick housekeeping for everyone. So today we're going to be using the chat function. So as we go through the session, please feel free to drop any questions for Adam, Colleen or even myself in there as we go. And as we get to the Q&A at the end, we'll actually we'll go through and try and answer as many of those questions as possible. Um, we'll also be dropping a few useful links um, towards the end of the session where there'll be documents and web pages um, to help you actually deep dive further into Australia cotton, the cotton industry here. Um, and any questions that we can't answer today, we will obviously be coming back to you via email. So please make sure they are in there. Um, if anyone does put an anonymous um, message in there, if you just want to email Brooke or myself um, after the session, we'll make sure we get back to you in person. Now let's start the session and officially welcome you to Cotton Australia's webinar series. There's nothing conventional about Australian cotton. The name of the series has been deliberately chosen because we know that in a world of fashion and textiles, conventional cotton is often seen as highly controversial. We'd like to challenge some of the current thinking and throughout the six par webinar series, highlight some of the globally unique strengths of Australian cotton. Over the coming months, we'll take a deep dive into the Australian cotton industry and its place in the global textile future. We'll follow the Australian cotton season, starting today with a seed that packs a punch because cotton's been planted in Australia as we speak. We'll connect you directly with the science, the farmers and the innovators that are taking the industry forward here in Australia. This series is brought to you by Cotton Australia and supported by a grant from the Agricultural Trade and Market Access Corporation. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to our guest speakers today, Adam Kay, who is the CEO of Cotton Australia, who you've just met, and Colin McMillan, a leading plant biologist from CSIRO. Is one of the most driven, experienced and passionate people I've had the pleasure to meet in the field of plant biology and science. I've also been extremely lucky to have a tour of CSIRO's facilities with Colleen and her team, which I have to say has been the highlight of the year. Colleen and her team work at the forefront of future-proofing Australia's cotton industry, with 100% of Australian cotton grown from CSIRO varieties. They're adding value at all levels of the Australian cotton industry, including molecular biology, plant breeding, crop management, and post-harvesting processing, just to name a few. I'll now hand over to Colleen so she can introduce herself and CSIRO. Thanks very much, Thea. So I'd first like to acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people on whose lands I'm, I'm presenting on to you today from. And I'd like to pay my respects to their elders past and present and emerging and to any First Nations people who are on this call. And also hi to everyone um, joining us today. I'm grateful um, to, to be on this land that they share with us here in Canberra. It is incredibly beautiful land right now in this place and all the orchids are blooming here on Black Mountain. So very beautiful in this moment right now. 
So I'm Colleen Macmillan. I work for the Australia's National Science Agency. Um, we have over 5,000 staff in Australia and we have over 55 sites. We're in the top 1% of global research agencies and we work with over 2,800 partners. Our core business is impact science, and so we have a really big breadth of impact science that we deliver. Agriculture and food, and I'll tell you a bit more about that in a minute. Manufacturing, health and biosecurity, land and water, oceans and atmosphere, minerals, energy. And we have some other enterprises such as Data61 and the national collections such as the herbarium, soils and insects, um, and, and much more. So I am a senior research scientist in agriculture and food, and that is quite a big business unit. We have about a thousand staff over 20 sites. And um, as a senior research scientist there, I'm really privileged to work in the cotton biotechnology group with some of the world's best leading cotton scientists from the molecular part to the disease resistance part um, and also supporting the breeders um, who are very close collaborators with us. So another hat that I have, in case some of you are passionate about this area too, is that for agriculture and food, I'm the inaugural lead for inclusion and diversity, because that's something we're very passionate about too. So I love plant cell walls in different crops, and I've been working on them for quite a while, from the tiny little molecules that make um, the materials all the way through to the material properties that they, they generate in everyday life for us. Um, so that's me. Thank you. OK, brilliant. Thank you, Colleen. That's fantastic. OK, so just to get us going, I'm just going to ask both yourself and Adam um, our first question. Um, so why is cotton such an important fibre to Australia and what excites you most about Australian cotton's future? Well, I think from my point of view, Thea, you know, cotton is the world's number one natural fibre. And, and we're incredibly good at producing it in Australia. We have the highest yields globally, so we're producing more cotton per unit area than anywhere else in the world. And um, I think the world is starting to understand how important natural fibres are now. You know, the, uh, you know, the, the data is coming through all the time around man-made fibres and the microplastic pollution and the fact that they don't biodegrade and um, yeah, when you're talking about cotton, you know, we don't have any of those problems. And so, uh, yeah, it's just uh, it's just a wonderful crop and we're very good at growing it in Australia. And um, yeah, we've got a, a an industry that's, um, you know, producing a crop that's in demand around the world. Yeah, brilliant. And Colleen? As a scientist, um, and you'll see in some of the things I want to share with you today, Australia has been really, really lucky to have science hold hands with breeding and um, the entire industry to generate innovation. And I have worked in other sectors before, um, not just in cotton, and that is a, an incredibly special and unique journey that we've seen, science right in the middle. Um, the second thing is that the Australian cotton in industry is very well integrated. Um, not fragmented like a lot of other industries. Um, and so that is quite special because as we face, face big challenges right now and into the future, they're going to be bigger challenges that come more frequently. Time is of the essence. So when you have a vertically and horizontally integrated system, like the cotton industry in Australia, talking to each other, working together, you can solve um, problems quickly and well because you're connected. Yeah, no, that's absolutely fascinating. And, um, you know, to, for us to be able to push that research and development further forward um, as a country together um, is, is absolutely brilliant. So, I mean, with that, Colleen, I'm going to hand over to you and let you take on your presentation because you've got so much more brilliant content to share with us today. Um, let's get started and hand over to you. All right, thank you very much. So this is what we're talking about today. And I am really totally in love with this plant. Um, I'm in love with lots of plants as a scientist, but this one is pretty amazing. So cotton bowl, when we dive into the actual seeds that grow these incredible plants, one of the things that as a plant biologist, I am totally in love with is when you take one of these seeds and 
you pull out the fiber off the surface of the seed, you can pull out just one fiber, which I'm doing right now. It's more than three centimeters long. You don't need a microscope to see it. And it's a single cell. And the biology of that is incredible. And one of the big messages that I want to share with you today is how human breeding, so humans breeding this, this incredible plant together with natural evolution has led to an incredible fiber that is, is amazing in terms of its biology and human existence. So let me share some cool biology with you today. Marvelous. Okay. So talking about the unique biology of the cotton plant, it is the world's largest plant fiber um, commodity for textiles. It is plant grown. It's renewable, it's biodegradable, but it's human bred, and that is very special. So when we look at that seed, um, it is incredibly long as a single fiber, and its biology is quite unique, um, and it goes back a long way. So I want to take you back in time, but also talk to you about incredible um, breeding that sits within that fiber, particularly Australia's story. But first, the cotton plant generates these incredible fibers, like other plant-based fibers, with an energy source that is by definition renewable. The cotton plant uses the sun as its energy source, not fossil fuels. So these green things called solar panels or leaves as we know it, harvest that energy and they create these incredible molecules that give the cotton fiber and the cotton plant um, its unique biology. So let's dive into that a little bit. So when the cotton plant generates flowers, this is the first day that that flower actually opens. And when you dive into that on that day, pollen grains actually um, fertilize the ovules and generate seeds on that very, very first day. It usually happens in the morning. So how do the fibers grow on those seeds? It is truly amazing. So um, here you can see from day naught all the way through to day 40, which is about, um, just over um, a month and a half and what you actually see is on the very first day of that um, seed starting to form on the surface of the seed little tiny cells start to balloon out these single cells and they grow incredibly fast within three weeks and they have these long long cells that is more than three and a half centimeters long but very very narrow 15 microns um, in diameter for example they can balloon out like that because that initially their walls are really soft and then after about um, uh, three weeks on the inside of that soft wall you have this incredible incredible material starting to form um, and that material is on the inside of that soft wall and it packs and it grows and it packs and grows until it's very thick and strong and then you get the final fiber that's actually opened up um, in a bowl so the bowl opens up and presents the fiber. Um, I'm holding that in my hand right here, right now. And then it um, can be ready for harvesting and ginning. So one of the things that's great about um, the cotton fiber is it presents its fiber and it doesn't need um, chemical treatment to release the fiber and it doesn't need water to re release the fiber. Um, the, the gin is the process by which the fiber is taken off um, the seed. And that's quite special. A bit more about the unique biology, and I hope you're enjoying a bit of the science here now. Um, <laughs> um, so when we take one of those single fibers and we cut it open and we look deep inside it, what we see is this really thick wall I talked about. And it's really special because it is 94% cellulose. It has virtually no lignin. So there's no um, requirement um, in terms of a lignocellulosic treatment to remove the lignin. And there's also some other sugars and poly saccharides and proteins in there as well. But it's this incredible wall and the shape of these fibers that really is the basis for its high tensile strength and the chemical composition and the shape of these fibers. And it's a basis for um, cotton being grown as a worldwide um, commodity. I just want to tell you how cool um, cellulose is, particularly in the cotton plant. So here you can see a singular chain of cellulose and it's a very simple molecule. So it is basically the sugar glucose 
individual glucose units linked from carbon one to carbon four, carbon one to carbon four in a very linear chain. And that simple linear chain gets packed into this incredible material. And there's some special bonding that occurs because of its unique shape that gives it that strength. Now, most cotton plants have a range of cellulose chain. And most plants have a range of cellulose chains. And the fancy word for the chain length is called degree of polymerization, DP. So most plants have a range of 500 um, up to um, a little bit more, but the cotton plant, um, it its ability and how humans have bred it means that the cotton cellulose chain lengths are up here in the thousands rather than in the hundreds. And that is incredibly critical to how, how the material behaves that we use in our textiles. So it has evolved as a, as a, um, a genus, the Cassipium genus. Um, and I want to take you back in time so I can tell you about the cool stuff we're doing now. So um, the Cassipium species evolved um, from about 10 million years ago, and there were about 15 species, 50 species that evolved all over the world, Northern Hemisphere and Southern Hemisphere, mostly in the arid dry regions. So a lot of the, the species are really good and um, evolved to handle drought and handle um, very hot conditions. So a lot of cotton species like to grow in hot, dry places and they can handle it really well. However, something really, really fascinating happened about five to 10,000 years ago, which is not that long ago. So there were these four independent human breeding events or domestication events for the, the cotton species. And there were four species that were independently um, domesticated. Um, so that was here in the Southeast Asia region, in the Africa um, region, in South America, and also in Central America, four separate events for four separate species. But this, um, this breeding um, with humans um, to generate these unique species was all around um, humans using the fiber and using this seed for oil. So that was for basically for nutrition and for clothes. Um, so if we jump right now to Australia, so here we are, um, the story of what's been going on here in terms of cotton and science in Australia. And it is a, a pretty special story. So one thing that um, is really special about how um, Australia growers um, and the industry uses cotton is, is mirrored by other countries as well. But I just wanted to point a spotlight on this. So basically the whole plant is used. So the fiber, the short fibers are used, um, the coming off the seed are used for um, paper and for um, banknotes, for example. The long fibers is what we spin into yarn for making textiles. The seeds are used for oil and for um, uh, soaps and um, cosmetics. But even at the end of the life of the plant, so cotton is grown as an annual, it's only one year, it's grown if it's grown, then the, um, the stems and the leaves are, uh, are tilled back into the soil. So that recycles the nutrients back into the soil for healthy soils. So the Australian cotton story, and I really want to go deeper now into the GM and technology story. It is very special because it is whole of industry. And that is very precious and very unique. Um, it's held hands with science for a long time and it's always been future facing, so always innovating. And like I said, I've worked in other industries um, in my other lives and this, this industry is, is incredible in terms of its how it innovates. So a bit of a timeline going back. Um, so in yellow here, you can see the timeline. Cotton first arrived um, in Australia through the first fleet via Brazil. And then really in the 1960s, that was the start of modern cotton um, breeding and technology. And it really has taken the, the industry to new heights. So some really key science pieces, particularly GM, that I wanted to show um, to you today. Um, first of all, in 1985, um, the first variety was released that um, was um, bred to be resistant to a bacterium, so Xanthomonas. So there's a lot of pests of cotton, and if there's a lot of pests, you don't get much yield. But there's this, um, packed into the DNA is this um, uh, a conventionally bred um, variety that is resistant to bacterial uh, blight. And by chance, it was also um, 
able to, to withstand insects. In 1991, this incredible variety was released that had improved resistance to um, a fungus, a verticillium fungus, and it gives verticillium wilt. And that also is uh, very damaging to um, cotton growth and yields um, and quality too. But then in 1986, the very first um, genetically modified cotton var variety was released here in Australia. It was called Ingard and it had the plant had inbuilt protection against insects. And we're going to dive deeper into that in a moment. In 2003, a more advanced version called Bolgard 2 was re released. And in 2016, Bolgard 3 was released. All three of these varieties have these built in ability to um, resist insects. Now, now you can see that there is this um, valleyed and troughed um, peaks and valley line, which is the actual yield that um, Australia has produced in terms of cotton fibre. And what you can see is that um, there is a cycle of peaks and valleys, and the key reason why that exists is because of water. So cotton growers only grow cotton, they choose to grow cotton and plant and cotton if they know there's going to be enough water and if there's not going to be enough water then that they choose to grow other crops and so you won't get much yield. So how does the GM actually work? Um, how, how has it been created and what does it do? So there is this um, naturally occurring bacterial set of proteins from this bacterium called Bacillus thuringiensis, Bt. You can see these rod-like bacteria here. And it's um, a soil-borne bacterium that is found in commonly in pretty much all soils. And the, the thing that the bacteria does, it, it produces um, uh, these um, this uh, insect called um, insect protein. So you can see they're actually protein crystals. So I've drawn it here as a crystal, Bt crystal. And it is toxic to some specific insects, not, not all um, insect pests. And there's a particular gene that the bacteria has to create um, this protein. So what scientists have done is to actually take the bacterial gene for the for the Bt um, protein and um, insert it into the genome of a cotton plant. So here you can see tiny little undifferentiated cotton cells and um, the genes actually being integrated into the DNA of the cotton um, cells. And then we use special hormones to recreate cotton plants. So here you can see a little um, embryo starting to grow leaves. And then um, in the lab, these then get generated into um, little plantlets that now have the bacterial gene within the cells of the cotton plant. And then we can um, plant out cotton plants that are able to make this particular um, protein, this Bt protein. So what this means is that um, the plant this Bt protein. So when insects come along and eat it, then the plant has its own um, naturally occurring insecticide. What this means is that you have a huge reduction in how much insecticide you actually have to spray on the crop. And since its introduction, there's been 85% um, reduction of insecticide use on Australian cotton farms, which of course have had lots of positive impacts, particularly to reduced chemical use and soil health. The tech doesn't stop there. Um, there's lots of great stories about the technology, but um, I just touch on something very briefly. Um, we're starting to explore circularity here in Australia in CSIRO around circular textiles. Um, we know that um, a linear path for energy flow and resource use is no longer good for the environment or for people or for the economies that we work in and live in. And it's a shifting towards a, a, a circular system. The four, four R's of um, circularity, reuse, recycle, reduce and redesign is something we're very conscious of. And if there's any interest um, later on in this um, event, we can talk a little bit about some of the redes redesign. Um, science that we're thinking of and starting to dabble in. So thank you very much. Um, thank you, Colleen. That was absolutely brilliant. And I'm sure that everyone has hundreds of questions um, from that because absolutely brilliant. Um, I just want to point out to everyone, as you probably realise, unfortunately, that our chat function has just stopped working for some reason. Um, technically, we can't get it back online as we speak. So what we're going to do is if you can just remember the questions that you want to ask at the end, we'll actually do a live session. So we'll bring everyone onto screen. Um, so who actually wants to turn on the cameras um, or their mics and ask a question live? That's how we'll do the Q&A at the end. 
Um, so moving, yep. Yeah, so Colleen, so back to you. Thank you very much. That's absolutely brilliant. Um, it's absolutely fascinating. The amazing properties of the cotton and the, you know the in the inner workings of cotton, and just obviously how brilliant it is also for the circular economy going forward. Um, you know, and how important it is to our future. So with that, Adam, I'm going to pass the hand over to you um, and let you share your side of um, everything that happens at Cotton Australia um, so everyone can listen to that presentation. Well, I'm hoping everyone can see my screen now and um, and thank you, uh, Colleen. You, you can see the uh, the passion that uh, that Colleen uh, has for the uh, for the cotton plant and the um, and the industry. It's uh, yeah, it's it's wonderful. So I'm going to just um, talk a little bit about the the seed that packs a punch. And um, you know, whilst we recognise that in some parts of the world the use of GM cotton seed has not always been success as successful as it has been um, in Australia. Um, you know, there have been in other countries disputes over licensing and the high cost of technologies and problems with resistance of insects and um, uh, uh, weed resistance, some drops in yield and quality in some countries, in some of the African countries, and, and the development of secondary pests becoming more prevalent and, and, and meaning an increased use in pesticides. So, you know, that certainly happened in some other countries. In Australia, we've had a, a very different experience, a far more positive experience with our use of biotechnology, and, and we've done it for the last 25 years safely and um, without incident. So it's um yeah it's it's really a, one of the great stories. Um, just want to start off by just uh, explaining that about ninety percent of our um our cotton farmers in Australia are actually family farmers. For some reason, the media just likes to put the spotlight on the bigger corporate operations, but ninety percent are family operators. They're making decisions based on the best science to protect their kids and the environment where they work and live. And so I just really wanted to um, highlight that um, to people on the on this webinar. At this time of the year, it's planting time. And, um, you know, we've mentioned it already up in, in, in many of the areas, cotton seeds are going into the ground as we speak. And um, it's really important starting the season um, to have, you know, we, we've got this year, we've got some water in the system. You know, we've had great rains over winter that have filled some of the dams. And, you know, people would know there's been magnificent flows through the river system. The Menindee Lakes are full. So there's water. The, the soil preparation has been done. And we've got the right seed varieties to put in the ground. It's just so important to have those varieties. And, and we want plants that just, when we put them in the ground, they just jump out of the ground and get going really fast. This season, we're anticipating a cotton crop size of around four and a half to five million bales. Now, you might not know what a bale of cotton is, but to put it in perspective, that's over a million tonnes of cotton fibre. And uh, yeah, a lot of a lot of cotton fibre. And to put it another way, that's around about a, a pair of jeans, T-shirt, underpants and socks for 500 million people. A half a billion people. So you can see that the Australian cotton crop is going to clothe an enormous amount of people. And um, yeah, it's it's um, going to be a, a great season. 99% of the cotton that we plant this year is going to be genetically modified cotton. And, um, you know, it all began in, um, in 1996 when we released the first genetically modified cotton. And um, and it um, you know for some people they it put fear into them about using a genetically modified crop, but in those days you know I think we would say we were overusing pesticide, we were overusing the chemicals to control the insects, and what this GM technology has done is let us massively reduce the amount of pesticide that we that we use on the crop, and um, so we've gone from you know seasons where there might have been fifteen or sixteen sprays back to you know one spray sometimes no sprays for insects so it's just a it's just a great story so over that um 25 years it's a, been a real success story and even before it was released in 1996 it's um it's fair to say there was many years of testing before that release so this was a well-researched product 
before it was released and then it was released conservatively to the industry. And I think it's a real success story. If we think about, you know, the, the key things that are the key benefits, as I mentioned, you know, 15 or 16 sprays back to none or one spray, you know, a massive reduction in the amount of pesticide that we've used. And GM Cotton has really enabled us to use an integrated pest management system where we're able to build up all the good bugs and the and the birds and the bats and the spiders to help us control the insects along with the the genetically modified um, crop. So it's it, that's a real a real part of this success is using the integrated pest management. We've had a lot less soil compaction because we're trafficking the soil a lot less these days. We don't, we don't have to traffic it with spray rigs to put on pesticide. There's a lot less traffic, a lot less compaction, and that's really good for soil health. We've got less greenhouse gas emissions, and that's important because, we're, again, we're using those tractors less. You know, We're burning less diesel, and that's um, leading to a reduction in greenhouse gases. And so that's you know, an important part of this story. And our yields have continued to rise through you know, better control of the insects and also the magnificent plant breeding of CSIRO. They've just done an incredible job at, at driving these yields and the quality of this Australian cotton up. And so what that all adds up to is just a more sustainable cotton industry that um, you know that hasn't had any problems over the last 25 years using the genetically modified cotton. I think that's you know it's been a, a true success story. And now, if we if we sort of think, well, what does that mean? How how does this all sort of come together? Well, it takes nearly half the water to grow a bale of cotton now than it did 20 years ago. So, big you know improvement in the water use efficiency. We take 34 percent less land. So, you know, we're, we're incredibly efficient producers of natural fibre, less land to produce that bale of cotton and a massive reduction in, in pesticide use, you know, and, um, uh, you know, a 97% reduction in, in pesticides. And, um, and that's really, you know, on the back of this combination of integrated pest management and genetic modification. So, yeah, just to think this little seed that Colleen was showing you before is just loaded with this technology that um, has had these massive impacts on our sustainability. Um, you know, the, these reductions in water, less land, less insecticide, you know, all through that technology that's packed into the cotton seed. So what, what makes us different? Why have we had the success stories that, whereas we've heard of some you know, problems in other countries? Well, one of the key things has been you know, we listen to our scientists. We've got such respect for our scientists in the Australian cotton industry, and we've listened to our scientists. And when they told us that resistance could be a threat with these new technologies, but there are tactics we can use to prevent resistance, we listened to them. And we had resistance management strategies. We used, they're basically tactics that we used to make sure that the insects wouldn't develop resistance. So those sorts of tactics are things like having a, very defined planting window. So we're not exposing the insects to these toxins all year round. We've had a refuge crop where we're planting a, a crop that generates susceptible insects. So if we did get a resistant insect, they would be mating with the susceptible insect and we wouldn't, uh, we wouldn't have uh, resistance. And we also use pupae busting in some instances. So insects, I think many of you know, insects pupate. They go into that cocoon, it's in the soil. If we run a plough through the soil when it's pupated, we can control the insects so we can break that cycle. So great tactics that our scientists have given us to manage resistance in the, in the industry. We also have this three-way joint venture or partnership. We've got Bayer Crop Science, who owns the gene technology, these incredible genes that we're putting into the plant. We've got the CSIRO that breed the varieties, these incredible varieties that have got wonderful fibre quality and high yield, as well as those resistances that uh, Colleen mentioned, the resistances to the, to the different diseases like verticillium wilt and bacterial blight. And then we've got Cottonseed Distributors, our grower-owned seed company that that commercialises the seed and multiplies it up and, and gets it out to the farmers. So this three-way partnership has been really successful. And then we've also got 
strong government regulation over using GMs. We've got the Office of the Gene Technology Regulator that was set up to, to regulate the introduction and management of genetically modified crops. So that's really important. And, and um, you know, anyone that um, misuses the crop and, and doesn't do the right thing and doesn't follow these strategies can have their access to the technology taken away. So really closely regulated. And the final point I just make on this on this slide is just around variety trials, because you know ninety nine percent of the farmers are growing these varieties, and the reason they're growing them is because they see them trial. We run across the industry all these variety trials. They see the trials. They know that these varieties are performing, and that gives them the confidence to grow them. So yeah, really important. And then just finally, you know, designing the the cotton plant of the of the future. You know, Australian. Cotton is research and innovation led. You know, there's there's lots of other genes that are out there that we might be able to pack into our little cotton seed that gives resistance to other pests and diseases. I know there's work around the world going on to um, cottons that are drought or heat stress tolerant, and that's really important in so many countries. Cottons that need less fertilizers, cottons that, that grow quicker and develop quicker, and whole heap of other novel properties, you know, different fibre qualities, longer staple length, fibre length, all those sorts of things. So it's really exciting time, you know, and, and um, that biotechnology, the work that Colleen and the team do, it's just so exciting. So um, I'll leave it there, Thea. Thank you for that. And um, yeah, I'll hand back to you. Okay, absolutely brilliant. Okay, Adam, I actually just want to ask you one of the questions. So Australia cot cotton's industry is underpinned by significant research effort that is funded by the cotton growers in partnership with the Australian government through the Cotton Research and Development Corporation, CRDC. Can you tell us about Cotton Australia's part in this effort? Well, you know, each farmer, every bale they produce, the farmer contributes a levy to research. So it's $2.25 goes into a pool for research and the government matches that dollar for dollar. So each year there's about $20 million to focus on research, you know, for the industry. And that research is how we've been able to drive that water use efficiency, how we've been able to, you know, get some of the better fibre quality, you know, how we've been able to address some of these sustainability issues. So, you know, it's a it's just this co-investment, the, the farmers putting money in with government and then, you know, driving to um to get um you know the science to to drive the industry forward. And Cotton Australia, we facilitate the growers um in giving their voice, letting their voice be amplified on what research they need on farm. What are the what are the issues they're seeing on farm that we need to address? So that's that's our role to uh, pass that feedback onto the Research and Development Corporation so they can fund work that's of real relevance out in the field. Yeah, brilliant. And I'm sure just one other quick question, because I'm sure that lots of people want to know, but how do when the how do the growers share their concerns and questions with you? Is that just at the annual meeting or throughout the year? Because I mean, that's we, fantastic. We, Everyone can connect. Yeah, look, it's something we're proud of because we want to make sure every farmer has a say in where that R&D dollar is spent. So we have in each of our cotton growing valleys or regions, our regional manager will facilitate a workshop and feedback sessions with the growers in that area. And then growers from each area come together at our general meetings and bring that feedback in. So, you know, sort of facilitated workshops so we can give that very clear feedback to the Research and Development Corporation uh, about what are the priorities from the farmer point of view. Yeah, no, absolutely brilliant. Um, okay, so I'm gonna actually ask both of you, um, both of you a question. Um, so a number of myths exist around water consumption in cotton production. From a country with significant water resource challenges, what is Cotton Australia's and CSIRO's position and perspective on these myths? and the effect um, it has on cotton as a sustainable fibre in the apparel industry? Well, I'm, I'm happy to make a, a start there because I think the, the thing you've said, it, it is a myth. You know, cotton uses the same as any other summer crop. You know, when we think about its, its water usage, um, it's very similar to corn, um, you know, same as soybeans. So, you know, it's it's just a summer growing plant. You know, there are other crops, and I don't want to throw other crops under the bus. There are others that um, use much more. But um, at the end of the day, it's, a, you know, a farmer's decision and, um, you know, what they grow to get the best return off their land and their water. So, uh, 
Yeah, but uh, you know the idea that cotton is somehow using more than other crops, summer crops, is um, you know is just not true. Yeah, and Colleen, do you have any thoughts on that as well? So cotton is grown um, as irrigated in Australia, but it's also grown as rain fed without um, being irrigated. And there's been a lot of breeding um, and management practice and research into how that can be done well and that continues because that's really important. Australia is a very big place and there are areas that are, f there is large amounts of water and there are areas that are very dry and that also fluctuates as the climate continues to change. And so that um, that effort in research is helping to make sure that um, where the crop is grown in a regional area, it's suited um, so it can produce a lot of yield. The other thing is that um, per hectare, so if you just think about a unit of land like a, a hectare, Australian cotton varieties, the way it's grown here in Australia, produces three times as much fibre per drop of water. Um, so if you wanted the same amount of fibre um, with other varieties or in other growing regions, you might need to use more water. So the, the, the way water is used um, here for growing cotton um, is is quite good comparatively to other areas. And that I think is an important thing to keep in mind too. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I think another thing from my perspective is that I think everyone, we all need to appreciate that some of the data that we've been pushing around in the fashion industry um, is from a very, very long time ago when we didn't have advanced technology and we weren't able to actually grow cotton in the way that we grow it today. So it, webinars like this are really important for everyone to actually sort of almost re-educate all of ourselves on cotton and actually how it's grown in different areas all around the world. Um, I think yeah. that's really I think important. That's, I think that's an important point there because, you know, I often have people talk to me about, you know, 20, 30 years ago when they saw the cotton industry, oh, there was so much water and so much pesticide. Well, I want to welcome them to the modern Australian cotton industry because it's changed. We heard those concerns. We invested a lot of money in R&D and this is where we've got to. So, you know, this is the modern industry and they need to let that past go and, and I'd welcome them out to have a look at the modern industry. Yeah, which is absolutely brilliant. I think the more people that can actually go out to the farms and actually um, see cotton being grown, um, will actually really help everyone change that narrative and understand actually what does happen today. Um, so brilliant. Um, so what do, to both of you, what do you think the future cotton farm will look like? Um, and where do you think we'll see them? Well, yeah, the, the future is the future's coming mm -hmm. pretty pretty quickly, Thea, because, you know, we've got out there um, available now, you know, tractors that steer themselves, you know, they're guided by the... Um, by the GPS and um, and uh, you know it's it's incredible. So you know there are um, systems where there's no one even on the tractor anymore. You know some sort of you know robot type systems. So that's incredible. You've got systems that where you do have to spray for weeds. You've you've got a camera on there that can actually see the weeds and just squirts a tiny little bit of spray onto the weed. So you're not just spraying heaps of chemical over a paddock. It's just little spot sprayers um you know it, it's just incredible where the technology is going i think about water use efficiency and there's a magnificent piece of csro technology called the canopy temperature sensor it's sensing the heat of the canopy of the crop as well as a probe down into the soil to tell you how much moisture is there and then it's looking at the future weather patterns and telling you when you should water so it's linking up all these things and i think that's where we're heading you know these incredible scientists linking, writing these algorithms that link up the weather data with the temperature of the crop, with the soil moisture, with the soil characteristics. And that all just drives better decision making and means we can be m even more and more efficient with our inputs, our water, our fertiliser, things like that. Yeah, no, absolutely incredible. And, you know, for everyone, again, watching, we will actually do a whole session on water. So, you know, do watch that for that coming up in, um, you know, a month or two's time. And um, so we can actually deep dive into that further. But, you know, the water is regulated in Australia. And, you know, when we've been out at farms, you know, we've had growers say to us, you know, they don't even use, the, they don't even use a majority of their um, actually allocation. They might actually only water once or twice. And in theory, they've got allocation to actually water about 12 times. So it's absolutely fascinating to actually understand the science behind, you know, the far, what the farmers do themselves. It's just incredible. 
Um, Colleen, so do you want to actually add anything in on that? If not, I've got a question that I'm going to go back to you that um, goes back to your session as we have time. <laughs> Well, I think precision agriculture using big data is the future of um, not just uh, cotton growing, but also of agriculture. So to follow on of on what Adam um, has painted a beautiful picture on. So having big data, so um, sensors that can capture lots and lots of data and algorithms that can then make, help us make decisions bigger than what the human brain can. So for example, um, finding out in large parts of Australia, but in high resolution, ah, there is some verticillium starting to grow in this patch and in this patch, not everywhere on the farm, but just in these two patches, right. So we need to water less there, but we can also do something um, as an intervention just in that patch to stop it from spreading too far. Similarly for insects, so big data, is um, where artificial intelligence can come in. We have some really interesting science happening at the moment using algorithms to look at how hairy cotton plant plants and leaves are just by using machine learning um, and artificial intelligence um, to help humans then make decisions in terms of breeding because us looking at a gazillion, okay, that's not a scientific term, but a lot of leaves to try and determine how many hairs there are on a leaf would just be impossible. It'd be a lifetime's worth of work, but getting machines to do those pieces of work so we can make better decisions for our breeding, for example, which has implications for insect resistance. So precision agriculture with big data is a key piece, but the future of the cotton farm also is um, integrated into a circular way so that the energy in that local region, not just isolated as a cotton farm, but integrated into that region with the people in the region, the um, energy flow in the region, the resource flow in the region. Um, so it's more interconnected at a regional level for the health and the profitability and the sustainability of everyone in that region. I think that is also part of the future. And of course, um, I'd have to say biotechnology would be right there in it as well. <laughs> Of course, of course. But I think you've just touched on a very important point, you know, which is the human part of our supply chain, um, full stop, because, you know, as everyone kind of takes fibres and puts them into materials and runs basically through to production, we do on quite a few occasions forget the human side of it and the communities that live around it. So that is absolutely key to the future, that that's the integration is going to get even closer and closer and it will actually look after local communities, villages, towns, other jobs. It's yeah, absolutely incredible. So um, I'm just going to take you back, Colleen, to um, a question that I wanted to ask you about, you know, do you think let's we're going to go a bit more fashion here. Um, do you think that brands should engage more with science of fibre production and how they can and how could they do this in ways that can increase customer engagement? Because this is something that the industry struggles with that, you know, we can't geek out with our customers because they're not going to walk into a shop and really want to know about the science. But it's a really important part as well. So have you got any ideas of how the industry could actually engage that conversation? I think it is a really critically important piece. Um, having brands, having designers, having um, people who actually create the textiles have a two-way, three-way, multi-way dialogue with scientists so that scientists can learn yeah. of, of, from what um, brands want, what, from what designers want and what they see for the future. So that's not our domain expertise. That's what other domain expertise is. But so it's a multi-way learning um, mm -hmm. from each other having really great dialogue so that we can co-create new things and also brands coming in and, and learning about, you know, things like the how cellulose is packed together completely changes how that material works. So I've worked in um, how what makes eucalypt trees strong and the molecules that do that. And it is just so different to how the cotton fibre and the molecule, molecules in that fibre works. Um, and so if you're going to create new materials, you know, even with dyeing, how cellulose is packed together impacts on how the dye can penetrate. The surface coatings on that fibre impacts on how the dyes can penetrate. So there's so many cool things we can co-create together. And who knows, um, having that di dialogue is really special. Now that COVID is giving us this gift of online um, connectedness, 
um, and we're more reliant on using technology um, in virtual platforms, offline and online. I would really love to see more of that happening between brands, but particularly around a dialogue, two-way, three-way dialogue around the science, what the science is now, and what solutions can be created um, together. That would be critical. Brilliant. Well, maybe that's something that we set up for a, a month or two's time or yes. maybe for earlier in the new year where we kind of do a round table with everyone that's on the call today, if everyone would like to. Um, and we actually have those discussions because, you know, unless we're there all talking together, um, you know, we can't learn more. So why don't we look at doing that? Um, yeah, definitely. that sounds awesome. And Colin, on that note of talking about colour, um, can you just talk about some of the advanced cotton um, innovations that are currently behind the scenes? And we know you can't talk about everything in too much detail, but could you just share a few little sort of insights to that? OK, sure. So um, we did start in CSIRO um, thinking about the circular economy, but particularly circular textiles. And the concepts around, you know, redesign um, married with reuse, reduce, recycle. But redesign, we were thinking about what can we do at the beginning of the, the fibre itself before it becomes a textile, um, before it becomes um, in use, and then when it falls down into landfill or when it gets washed and the microfibres get um, washed into the waterways, what can we do to produce fibers that are still renewable by definition so plant-based fibers using photosynthesis to suck up carbon dioxide and create new molecules um, using the energy of the sun so by definition renewable but also biodegradable so fibers that actually once they are in the life cycle of use and also at the end of the life when they get washed you're not having um, microplastics persist in the soil, persist in um, the waterways, persist in the the, the ecosystem, particularly um, in the oceans, um, where those microplastics just don't get break down. So materials that are biologically biodegradable. Um, so we've been um, very fortunate. Um, currently, it's only a small one project, but um, it's from this future science um, technology platform that CSIRO um, has created looking to the future. And it's, it's using synthetic biology principles to put building blocks into, test building blocks and put them into the cotton plant to see if we can get the cotton plant to make um, novel properties. So um, yeah, we started to dream um, things like self-dyeing, or dye-free cotton and um, perhaps stretch cotton. Um, those are the building box concepts that we've been um, exploring. Um, yes, yeah. Absolutely brilliant. Okay, so uh, thank you so much. That's just um, been absolutely fascinating. So, okay, what we're going to do, everyone, we're going to go through and actually turn everyone's mics on. Some people will be able to see that we've started to turn on those on already. If you can just keep your mic turned off at your end um, until you're ready to answer a question. We've got a few more to turn on yet, so just bear with us for a second. Um, but you know, before we go, I just want to kind of, or before we go into Q and A, um, I just want to say to everyone, please follow um, Cotton Australia um, via their Instagram account and sign up to the newsletter, so we can let you know about the up and coming events. And also for questions that we can't get through today, if you could email them over to, I'm going to say probably me for the moment, um, at thea at rawassembly dot com. Um, and for those who have Brooke's email, um, also Brooke, which I'll read out to you in a second. Um, and then we can obviously get those answered that we can't get to today in a second. Um, and I also, again, just before we go into q and I'm actually just going to say thank you to our um, brilliant presenters today. Um, it's absolutely brilliant, you know, just having you share your valuable insights in Australian cotton. Um, and also then, you know, before again, we're going to Q&A, just thank you to everyone that has joined us today, you know, all the way from London across to Paris. We have Hong Kong on the call. Um, it's absolutely brilliant to have you all with us. So, OK, I'm going to turn on everyone's microphones. Um, if there's anyone that's got a microphone on already, if you'd like to ask a question, please feel free. Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah, perfect. OK, fantastic. Um, hi, thanks for a great presentation. Um, I'm a textile designer. I work with um, entirely natural fibres and natural dyes. And um, But what I'm curious is sort of more in your league, uh, both of you. I'm curious about if crop rotation will play any part in the future of Australian cotton and if there are benefits or detriments there. Thank you. I, I, Eloise, it's Adam here. Um, 
crop rotation is already a really important part of uh, of what we do. Um, most cotton is rotated with um, cereal crops like wheat, and that's important because cotton being a broadleaf crop and wheat being a grass crop, um, they have different pests and um, and different diseases, and so it gives a break in the in the disease the disease cycle and the pest cycle. So it's it's really um, you know that's really useful to have a a grass crop or a cereal crop as your main rotation. So um, yeah, we certainly already um, you know place a, a high value on rotation crops. Some farmers utilise. Um, legume crops in their rotation, so crops like faba beans uh, and alike that put some nitrogen into the soil. So they value the the nitrogen and organic matter that you might get from uh, from a, a crop like a faba bean or, um, or or something like that. So um, yeah, very important part of the um, of the current system. Okay, so next question. Um... Evangeline, um, would you like to ask your question? Hi, yes, thank you. It was a brilliant presentation, um, uh, uh, Adam and, and Colleen. I really, really enjoyed it. Um, I'm Evangeline from Technical Fabric Services. We are a vertical textile mill, so we knit, dye and finish fabrics here in Queensland. And we use a lot, a lot of cotton in our products, and we export a lot of a lot of our products uh, offshore. Um, whilst we request and have paid for Australian cotton on our on our invoices and our letter credits showing Australian cotton, will there be any work towards getting a, an identifier in the cotton? Yeah, that's a it's a very good question because um, when Thea was talking about getting feedback from brands and retailers and and people in the supply chain. I know when I get out there and Brooke on our team gets out there and we ask, we always asking what research should we be doing? And this traceability question comes up all the time. And there are a number of, you know, technologies that are sort of hitting the market at the moment. Um, there is uh, a, a, a technology called Oritane where they're using elemental analysis that can, um, if you like, fingerprint where a cotton has come from. There is a technology called Fibre Trace, which um, again can um, uh, you you add a, a fibre in at the processing part of the gin that um, can assist with the uh, traceability. And there's also um, a company Adnas that, where there's a um, a spray a DNA spray that goes on again at the cotton gin that can help identify the cotton through the process. So there are some technologies really coming online now that can be a, an important sort of physical check in a in a blockchain or a, even a, a paper-based system. You know, it's all very well and good, but having that physical check in there to make sure it, it could be really valuable. So I think you're going to see more of these technologies in the next few years. Fantastic. Thank you. We have a hand, a hand up from you. Would you like to ask a question? Hi, can you hear me? Yep, all good. Hi. Okay, great. Hi, it's Nessie, by the way. Elizabeth is oh, my name. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yeah, great presentation. Um, some of the science probably went over my head a bit, but um, I would love to come to CSIRO and join in on a roundtable. That would be amazing. Um, I guess my question comes from maybe a little bit naive and also uh, just like, as you said, like historical, you know, the way that was marketed cotton and cotton's got a bad name, etc. My understanding of GMO, I guess I'm interested in, obviously you mentioned that other parts of the world have had problems with, say, licensing and other issues like that. How does this, I mean, obviously you kind of said Australia's done it really well, but what's the role of, I guess, biodiversity in our cottons? Like how important is it to, say, keep heritage seeds? The seeds themselves that you use, do you have to buy them annually or can you actually like use the seeds from the plants again? Um, and you did mention, obviously, like the rotating of crops, but I'm also interested in the farming practices, I guess, that might be nuanced to each farm. But like, are you exploring things like, I mean, can you do no-till and other things like that when you're growing the cotton? Um, so that's probably a bag of questions there. But <laughs> good, good questions, though. No, they're, they're, they're great questions. Did you want to jump in, Colleen, or do you want me to? Um, happy for you to go. Um, okay. 
Well, I think you you talked about the um, the heritage seeds and and that, and I know that um, Colleen's CSIRO colleagues that do the plant breeding have a, a great seed bank. You know, so it's a, you know it's a cold store where they've just got germplasm from all over the world, and as well as the material they've developed. So there's there's GM, non-GM, all sorts of cottons because it's that diversity in base that's been a strength of the CSIRO breeding program. You know, when when um, the the sort of the father of cotton breeding in Australia, Norm Thompson, first started the cotton breeding, there was no such thing as GM cotton. And so he would take cottons that he collected from Uzbekistan and Iran and whatever that had special traits and cross them with the Australian cottons to try and, and get the disease resistances and the insect resistances just using old plant breeding. So there's a there is a magnificent bank of of seed there that the breeders draw on all the time for these traits and it's really important and um, it, it's you know so yeah and we and we don't just rely all the time on the GM you know the breeders still use old fashioned plant breeding to get on top of these other pests so whilst you know the GM sometimes takes the spotlight they use all the old fashioned plant breeding to get resistance to the verticillium wilt and the bacterial blight and um, the fusarium wilt and the other pests. Um, yeah, so it, it's a great question. As far as your question around the sort of the practices, yeah, no till and reduced tillage is, um, you know, is really part of um, of uh, how we grow cotton. And um, and that's that's seen a massive reduction in tillage over the last 20 years, you know, when I first started in the industry 35 years ago, it was, it was you know, you would probably plough the soil from the end of one crop to the start of another crop. You know, there'd probably be six or seven times that the soil was tilled before you planted that crop. And um, and really that, you know, we've been able to move away, um, you know, move away from that and go to, you know, one or two tillage passes and really reduce the amount of diesel we're burning, the amount of compaction, and um, and 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 also every time you till the soil, you're burning up soil carbon, and so that means that we can you know hold soil carbon and organic matter there. And I think the the other part of your question was um, uh, around um, do we buy the seed each year? Look, even before GM cotton, we bought the seed each year because. Cotton seed, you saw that little seed that Colleen pulled out at the start of this webinar and it's got all that fuzz on it. Cotton seed won't just, you can't just keep your own seed like that. It won't run through a modern cotton planter. And so that's where that company, Cotton Seed Distributors that I mentioned comes in because they prepare the seed for planting. And so it's um, they run it through a, a, um, a process that removes that lint and then it can just flow through the planter so that we can get exactly the right number of plants per square meter to maximize the yield so yes even before gm we we um you know bought our seed every year okay um has anyone else got any questions that they would like to ask um we we are over by about eight minutes but if anyone does want to ask please feel free now um if not as i said email us and i'm just going to see if i can just um Thank you. Um, share my screen for two seconds. And OK, so just layman way of doing things. Um, this is Brooke's email at brooke at stepcommunication.com. Um, my email at thea at rawassembly.com and the Instagram um, at oscotton. Um, for everyone to basically be able to reach out with additional questions. Um, so I'll just leave it up for a few more seconds. But um, again, I'd like to thank everyone um, for joining us today. I hope you've been inspired and learnt um, a whole lot of information about Australian cotton and what happens in this country um, and how it all starts with CSIRO. Um, we will be having a few, obviously, another five webinars um, coming up in the coming months. So follow us on Instagram um, and we'll let you know when the next sessions are. So. Yep. There might be a final question there. I see just oh, popped we've got up there. Samantha. Okay, so well, let's go over. If Colleen and Adam, you both are still good. Um, um, yeah. Everyone I'm... else, is leave. Um, thank you very much for joining us. And but we'll keep we we'll can keep asking answering questions. Um, so Samantha, over to you. Hi guys. Uh, my name's Sam. I'm calling from uh, another clothing brand called Artnum. 
Um, I'll keep it quick, but essentially my question uh, is just about the pesticides used. Um, we've had a bit of communication with Brooke at Cotton Australia already, uh, and we're looking to integrate um, Australian cotton into our supply chain. And it's just a bit of a transition from us where we've always used organic cotton and we've always spoken to our customers about the detrimental impacts of insecticides and pesticides um, on the environment and biodiversity and the impact on um, species. And I think it's amazing what you guys have done about reducing the insecticide use down um, by 85%. And I was just kind of wondering, is the goal to get to a zero percentage um, level of insecticide use is that even possible and then what is the impact on like runoffs for water systems or biodiversity and all the other species kind of living around the cotton fields yeah no it's, it's a, a great question there um, Sam and um, and certainly um, you know the target is zero you know no, no one wants to pay money to a company to buy chemicals but you know I think the other thing got to realize you know that that bt that bacillus thuringiensis that um colleen talked about has been engineered into the cotton plant well that same that same protein is is sprayed by organic farmers on on their crop so it's in a way it's just genetically engineering in the um the same uh, the same chemical but it's just genetically engineered in instead of you know, even organic farmers spraying that, and and I and I think look, you know, I've been involved with farmers in Australia growing organic cotton, and whilst they might not be able to use the sort of chemicals that we we think about out of the drum, you know, they're still, you know, I've seen them using you know sulphur dust and things like that that are still pretty pretty toxic, um, you know, if you if you do the wrong thing. So I'm not, you know, I think there's a great place for all cotton and um we've just got to keep it in um really in perspective and and what we want to do is you know reduce that impact on biodiversity you talked about the runoff you know irrigated cotton systems they keep as a closed system so that you know if there is rainfall on that cotton field you know we we keep it you know on the field we've got to we've got to trap that water to make sure that it doesn't enter the the river system to prevent any chance of um of of chemical getting you know outside of the of the system so um yeah it's it's really important to to us and we're doing lots of work at the moment on that on that biodiversity piece because we've we've seen how the biodiversity comes back when you reduce the number of pesticides and and you talk to the farmers they'll tell you at picking time they're driving through and there's just spider webs all over the front of their their pickers and and all these you know ladybirds stuck to them and things like that you know the yeah you know, when you can reduce the amount of pesticide that's used nature and the biodiversity will come back in and um and we we're sort of seeing that all the time yeah that's really um it's really good to hear and I guess it comes back to that conversation with the consumer as well and about educating them about the difference between organic cotton and then why switching to Australian cotton but also not geeking out too much in the science of it because you don't want them to switch off and I guess that's kind of the battle that we're playing at the moment of yeah how to give them enough information that they can see that the, the decision that we've made is researched and thought out but not too much that they tune out yeah and and look I think also for a lot of people at at, if you want to go to scale, you know, organic sort of, you know, organic's great, but it's sort of pretty small and niche. And and I've also, with the farmers I've worked with in Australia that have tried organic, you know, the yields are down uh, and, that, and so you're using the same amount of water to grow the plant, but you're getting half the yield. And so with our most precious resource, the water, you're actually being as efficient. And, and so it's just something to contemplate. I, I'm not trying to... Um, I'm not trying to sort of, uh, you know, dis uh, organic. I think it's great. I think all cotton is great in Australia, but it just it's just getting that balance, that perspective on it. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, as Sam, you know, we've discussed this in the past. I think it's, you know, each brand have to, you have to see what's also right for you and where you're yeah. producing as well. Um, so that's, you know, that's really important. Yeah. Um, right. I think. Do we have any other questions? Um, anyone else wanting to ask something that they've kind of got on, wanting to ask, or, you know, forever and ever? And whilst we've got Colleen and Adam on this call, um, let us know. 
if not, we will wrap this up. And again, thank you very much um, to everyone for joining us. Thank you to the incredible presenters today um, and the amount of information that has been shared. Um, we obviously, as I keep saying, we have you know five more webinars to come um, and the next one will probably um, be on water, I suspect, because it's a, the next key conversation that everyone wants to kind of really deep dive into. So we'll get that up live soon um, and share who are going to be our specialist speakers for the day. Um, and again, we will look at doing a round table with everyone, um, maybe as so early in the new year after the holidays um, or, or maybe even before. And so we can actually all kind of discuss in person. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you all.